Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the closing plenary of the 2018 Edinburgh International Culture Summit. And this particular session aims to bring together uh, the various threads of discussion we've been having over the last few days. Uh, I'd like to start, if I can, by inviting our four lead rapporteurs back to report back on the policy discussions, starting with Ruth Hogarth. Thank you to the presiding officers and good afternoon, everybody. So these are the top headlines from this morning's culture and well-being sessions. The top one in terms of well-being is that medicine alone cannot do everything. So I'm obviously not going to be able to do justice to all the conversations that have taken place this morning. So allow me just to pull out three very top level common themes. First the, is from a research point of view, it's really striking that there's a substantial body of data and evidence base to demonstrate the value of arts and culture to health and well-being. And that's across a wide range of disciplines, from arts and cultural studies to psychology and neuroscience to education and to politics, and across the full range of artistic practice too, from performing and visual arts to literature, museums, and of course, digital art forms. So I think we can now say unequivocally that the evidence is there. Participation in arts and culture really does enhance well-being. Let's put that data to use. Secondly, in terms of the artist, and that's my shorthand for all arts and cultural practitioners, what emerged from the roundtables was the imperative for including the kind of experiential and embodied knowledge that an artist brings into well-being research, into health provision, and into policy making. So we bring together theory, practice, and policy with the artist integrally engaged as a practice-based researcher, as a co-creator of knowledge and of policy, and crucially, as a driver of innovation. Artists think differently. Um, that's obviously already happening, as we've seen all throughout these two days, but it's often still too difficult to work across the boundaries. There are still too many barriers to this kind of collaboration for all sorts of reasons, from economic scarcity, restrictive funding models, mismatches between policy and practice. I think someone mentioned fear, mistrust, and to a lack of joined up policy making in arts, in health, in education, and in provision. Third and last point I want to make, while it's really clear in this area, I thought, more than of all the three areas, there are huge opportunities, but there are still big challenges. Not least, and despite a huge amount of goodwill, policymakers struggle with the stark reality of budgets. We just have to acknowledge that. But leaving money aside for the moment, if we can, another challenge which came across, which I thought was really interesting, was that of translation. So I'm an artist, I don't do data. I'm an artist, I'm not a therapist. And so by translation, I mean trying to bridge the gap between the languages of the artist, the academy, and the policymaker. Of course, there are exceptions, but for most people, people working in these different fields come from different tribes, and they need to learn to speak each other's languages to work together more effectively for well-being. I think this summit has been an excellent opportunity to bridge that gap. So thank you to Jonathan, and that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. And now Catherine Holden to report back on the culture and investment strand. So good afternoon, everybody. Culture and investments, what's the bottom line? Adam Smith, the Scottish economist, published The Wealth of Nations 250 years ago, a seismic shift in economic thinking at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. As we now ride the digital revolution, can we redefine notions of wealth? is a new wealth of nations found in creativity, in knowledge resources, in communicative power, and in culture. So our sessions looked at ideas of value and worth, at the places, at what you might call the plumbing of cultural infrastructure, and the people who make it all happen. How do we assess where we invest and whose culture we invest in? We heard from artists and economists, architects and directors, professors and practitioners, researchers and designers, filmmakers, placemakers and policymakers. 
we explored regional and national investment models from across the globe, from full state funding, with all its comforts, but all its dangers of dependency, complacency, and political influence. We looked at a more Darwinian, competitive sphere, reliant on responsiveness to markets and funders' plural agendas, for better or for worse. However, speakers often reflected that investment is not only about money, but investing time, offering wisdom, sharing skills. It's about the practicalities, providing places for artists to work, to create, to perform and exhibit, mapping underused areas and zoning them for artistic practice in the face of competition for housing or commercial development. It's about sharing facilities, equipment, materials, and accommodating the glorious messiness of artistic production. It's also about supporting artists' own self-sustainability in professional practice, in knowledge of marketing, business development, legal compliance, insurance, tax, all the maybe deeply unsexy sides of life, but nevertheless the stuff of economic life. 21 years now after the Bill Bow gave birth to what we now know as the Guggenheim effect, we heard about the role of the V&A in igniting what the local papers are calling Dundee's New Dawn, working in an innovative partnership with universities, with city authorities, with enterprise agencies, businesses and donors to change a city, no small ambition, which Dundonian novelist A.L. Kennedy previously saw as a grey, lifeless place she was once desperate to leave, to a place now labelled by GQ as Britain's coolest little city. And some of us will see that tonight. Cultural placemaking can be about the remarkable mega build costing mega millions, but also about rediscovering what you already have, the talents of the nation, the potential of your assets. It's yes to the shiny and the new, but also to burnishing old gold allowing and encouraging artists to animate your parks, your squares, and your streets. Just look at Edinburgh now. This is let us do the show right here. It's less about expense and more about experience. Aligned with this, we heard about agile cities and lively infrastructures, using pilot pop-up and experimental spaces, creating temporary structures which enable producers to test ideas for big developments and trial them live in real time with real people. We agreed culture is not a crude tool of regeneration, a socio-economic food parcel to parachute drop. Real success springs from below and is rooted in genuine need. In this way, cultural projects tackle rather than compete with civic challenges. The investment choice is not capital versus community, but capital because of community. And that community can be complex. Major developments can embrace difficulty, ambiguity, and sensitivities. The National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington expects its visitors to work to grapple with issues. And this investment has produced not just a museum, but a social space, a pilgrimage site, and a place of resistance. It is winning thousands of visitors a day, millions a year. Our speakers also encourage us to take the long view and develop longer standing relationships with our architects, our city planners, our social and educational services, and take a whole life view of our buildings, programs, and institutions, their birth, maturing, and aftermath, which flexes with changing times. And finally, we too heard a plea for a different kind of multilingualism. Let's get fluent in the language of other policymakers, the ones who aren't in the room today, the community leaders, grassroots influencers, budget holders, and decision makers in political, economic, social, and educational circles. Because all investors want a payoff, a return on investment. And the good news is that as our three sessions showed, culture can deliver individually and in community. Resilience, pride, creativity, confidence, health and well-being, a sense of identity and self-worth. And surely this is the true life of wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I would now like to hear from Asif Majid, who will report on the culture in a network world strand. Asif.
Thank you very much, presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen. As far as culture to networked world is concerned, I want to speak on four main points. Tensions, research questions and things we need to think about moving forward, what might look in terms of policy proposals, and then just a few thoughts to make it possible for us to really tap into the experience that we've had over the past two days. In terms of tensions, the first thing I want to recognize is that none of the categories that I'm speaking about are things that need to be understood as static, rather they need to be understood as dynamic, fluid, and always moving. Networks are in fact about connectivity, and culture itself is something that continues to be shaped by the experiences of what's around it and also what's within it. Some of the tensions that emerged within the, public, within the small group discussions that we had were things around multiplicity compared to integration, the local and the global, the ecosystem versus the ego system, tradition or contemporary practice, independent or interdependent, private, public, pride, anxiety, professional, personal, structures and individuals, top down versus bottom up, and then of course complexity and simplicity. Now again, the thing that we need to recognize when we're looking at this from a policy perspective is that every single one of these categories requires a constant oscillation, requires a constant recognition of the fact that we cannot say that only complexity is the answer or only simplicity is the answer. So to that effect, some of the research questions and things we might be thinking about in terms of a way forward have to do with how we can wrestle with both creating structures from a political and policy perspective that institutionalize the space that artists young people and practitioners need to be able to work effectively in the context in which they find themselves. An example of this would be, how can we institutionalize open space that enables person-to-person -person connections? How do we diffuse power from ministerial politics to young artists? How do we uh, deal with multifaceted policies that can be implemented at interpersonal, local, community, regional, and national levels that serve as gateways for artists to take the lead? And also, how do policymakers integrate art makers into their decision-making processes and fund the art making experience over and above the product of art itself? When it comes down to it, making the possibility for these spaces, even if they are institutionally structured, it makes something that is, that is significantly more relevant to the way in which actual practice is happening on the ground. So in terms of the policy proposals and things that we might be thinking about, there's a huge emphasis that came out of the discussions on relationships. And there's a huge emphasis on how do we preserve the humanity of the relationships. From the top-down perspective of what a policy thinker might be focusing on compared to the bottom-up practice that an artist or a young person, for example, might be thinking on. The examples of Denmark and of Scotland in terms of their youth arts advisory councils were brought up and those were hugely successful. But also within that we need to recognize that youth is not a one size fits all category. It is in fact differentiated and must be differentiatable within and among the types of youth that we see along race, class, gender, sexuality and other uh, lines. A final thing that I might think about in terms of policy proposals is that within this, policy must be considered at multifarious and sort of multifaceted levels. Things that address various stakeholders and account for the differentiation that recognizes that context matters. And it cannot, again, be a one size fits all solution. In terms of structures and how we, uh, how we make it possible to, to inc include the dynamism and flexibility, we need to be open by design. One of the things that's been beautiful about this summit is the way in which the presiding officer, for example, has been really generous with allowing people to take the time that they need to speak, right? And allowing that flexibility as much as it's been, I wasn't, that wasn't a knock, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, that, that as much, and as much as that's something that we have to inbuild because there are structures that we need to fit into and boxes that we need to map, there are also, there's also the importance to recognize that things take time and it's okay to let them do that. The last thing then that I would mention is a return to three moments of connection that we, that we all experience together in this chamber to remind us of what it is like to be in a networked world and to use culture as the way of dealing with it. The moment of silence that we all held together standing in honor of Kofi Annan, singing this morning with Toto and David, which though they were not part of the culture in a networked world stream, definitely connected all the way across. And also, together, our instantaneous and collective decision to offer a standing ovation for Julian after his performance this morning. These moments are the types of moments that we need to clarify and we need to be able to make happen as much as humanly possible in ways that are both institutionalized but also recognize the facet of this. I'll leave you then with two ideas. 
There is radical potential in creating beautiful things. That's idea one. And the second idea returns to Ang Kang Sen's idea from the very first speech that he gave, which is that we need to hold on to the lived experience of being with one another. Because failure to do so means failure to understand that our networks are really about the people that we are with on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. And our last reporters are reporting back on the youth programme, and I can invite Emma Roos and Ariane Welsh to present. So to report back on this year's youth programme, I need to throw us back to two years ago at the Culture Summit 2016, which was the first time young people were invited to attend. The youth summit started as a completely separate strand and throughout the three days became intertwined. And I stood here and I spoke to all the delegates and I asked them all to go back to their country and to talk to their young people. I was ecstatic a year later when we were approached by the Culture Summit team to lead on the youth delegations here at the summit. We are the National Youth Arts Advisory Group. You may have heard us over the past few days. I know we've not been quiet. We've been some of your delegates, speakers, and rapporteurs. And outside of us, throughout the program, there have been young people integrated seamlessly. Even when the young people haven't been present at discussions, the discussions have still mentioned them. They've still been involved. And it's been incredible to see the support that this, everyone in this room has for the value of young people in, across the globe. We've also, as Asif mentioned, seen the value of their having a National Youth Arts Advisory Group. So anyone who might be interested should definitely consider going back to their country and trying to create something similar or see what they could possibly do to allow the youth of their country to have voices. In case you are interested, there is a document about NIAG, the National Youth Arts Advisory Group, inside your delegation pack that I would definitely recommend reading and includes an incredible introduction from our Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop. One of the most important things we've definitely done over the past three days was to hold a youth delegate meeting prior to the opening of the summit. It was incredible to hear what everyone had to say and get the opportunity to meet them, as this is the first time every country was invited to bring their own youth delegate. We spoke about the key themes, though I won't delve into that too much as we've had three incredible summaries already, and much of it was in alignment. But we also asked them the question, what does culture mean to you? And what one of the youth delegates said I thought was incredible, so I will just repeat it to you now. Culture is a way of life, a way of how I express myself, a way my life is formed. Culture defines me, and it is not how I define my culture. The theme of this summit, connecting peoples and places, perhaps has never been so apt. As Scotland celebrates the Year of Young People, we also celebrate the fact that young people have been involved in every aspect of the past three days. As I can confidently and probably slightly biasly say, the variety, organisation and structure of this year's summit has been vastly improved by involving young people. And this involvement prompts an interesting provocation. In the Our Shared World Youth Engagement discussion, which featured a panel entirely made up of young artists and game changers, it was suggested that we do not need to create a space where the ideas and values of young people can be explored. This space already exists. The focus should be on an integrating young people at all stages of the decision-making and strategic planning process. Only then can arts and culture remain relevant and challenging. I'm reminded of Wednesday's opening statements from Sir Jonathan and also from First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, who both referenced Robert F. Kennedy. When asked about the value of youth, Mr. Kennedy said, the world demands the qualities of youth, not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the life of ease. We often hear that young people are the next generation, the future of our country. But are we overlooking the contribution that young people can make today? We are the now. Young people have a unique ability to challenge and upset the status quo for the better. Our provocation for you all today, use this power of imagination, harness this drive for change, and who knows what incredible and defining things we can achieve together. Thank you.
Thank you, Emma and Ariane. Can I thank all our rapporteurs uh, who presented it this afternoon, but can I also thank all the rapporteurs who worked uh, throughout the conference to uh, bring back and to pull these strands together. Uh, I think we're all very grateful indeed for your work. We're now going to turn, um, I'm particularly conscious we've got the heads of delegations we'd like to make a few contributions. And I'll just emphasize that uh, this particular session, um, because there are buses waiting to take half of you to Dundee, uh, the session has to begin to close at quarter to quarter to three. So please keep your contributions short, three minutes if possible, four at the tops, uh, and then we'll get everybody in. Uh, could I call first from Zambia, the Honourable Charles R. Banda, Minister of Tourism and Arts. <coughs> thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, let me also thank all my colleagues who have uh, come to attend the summit. I wish to begin by saying that uh, we are very grateful that you invited us, uh, Zambia, to come and attend this summit, which we have found very, very, very useful. The presentations have been very good right from day one when we started listening to our colleagues expressing the different competences on the topics that were given uh, for us to, to discuss. It has come out very clearly here that uh, all of us are discussing culture in the same vein. There are certain things maybe that we are lacking to reposition culture and put it exactly where it is supposed to, to be in as far as our economies are concerned. Well-being is concerned. We're talking about health care. Also talking about uh, connectivity. So through the different presentations that were given, I'm very, very satisfied that we have been able to explain the importance of culture in as far as our lives are concerned. I attended uh, a round table uh, discussion this afternoon where one speaker actually asked all of us to go back home where we have come from and tell our ministers of health how important culture and art are to the well-being of the people. And I believe it, because looking, from, uh, looking at the presentation which was done by one professor here this morning, who talked about uh, culture, art, and uh, the, the mental status of uh, different people and so forth and so on, I have every belief that we have a duty to ensure that we reposition culture, art, and put them where they're supposed to be for the well-being of our people. In all aspects, right from the economies of our countries, culture plays a part. When you talk about connectivity, culture plays a very big role. When you talk about healthcare, culture plays a very big role. As a policymaker, I think I've got a duty to ensure that we revisit the position of culture now and ensure that we place culture and art where they belong. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Korea next, and then after that, Gambia. But first of all, from the Republic of Korea, the Deputy Minister of Culture, Sports and Tourism, Wu Sung Lee. Hello to all delegations. Uh, this is Wu Sung Lee. I'm the Deputy Minister of Culture and Korean Government. Uh, I'm so honored to, uh, to make speech at closing day. Uh, I would like to uh, extend my sincere gratitude to the Scottish government and the parliament for the successful organizations of the 2018 Edinburgh International Cultural Summit. The overall theme of the 18, 2018 Cultural Summit, culture connecting peoples and place, as well as the themes for the each sessions explore the expanded role of the culture as it move beyond the traditional and customary role it has played in the past. The Korean government has for a long time been reflecting on the possible roles culture can play in a society that is currently fractured in and conflicted. You are able to focus our response into cultural vision 2030, Korean long-term cultural policy blueprint. It was announced to the public in May 2018. I would like to share this with you today. 
the Korean government first expanded the meaning of culture uh, so that through the culture itself, we may be able to activity, actively respond to and keenly serve social issues. Cultural Vision 2030 is a comprehensive policy blueprint that includes a, a range of people and human beings centered cultural policies and the programs. It is composed of three main values, autonomy, diversity, and creativity. First, guaranteeing one's autonomy means that everyone has an inalienable right to freedom of expressions and the freedom to enjoy culture. In order to achieve complete personal, personal autonomy, we would like to first guarantee the status and the rights of cultural artists and workers. To this end, we plan to make amendment to the con constitutions so that freedom of expressions is explicitly stipulated and so that the preventions of approval or prior censorship on such expression is clarified in the constitutional text. We will also be able to strengthen the autonomy of government affiliated cultural institutions and we will be able to establish a social security system for artists and athletes. Moving forward in order to expand the public ability to exercise their cultural right, the Korean government plans to directly stipulate those cultural rights in the constitutions and will endeavor to reduce cultural divide by providing a new step cultural card a government subsidy given to the households with a child entering the primary school. Secondly, this long-term policy focused on the value of diversity. Minister, I can tell you've got a number of points, but I wonder if I could ask you to make them short, make your second and third okay, point okay. and conclude. Okay. Thank you. Uh, realizations of the diverse communities means uh, respecting different culture that are based on the unique identities. Uh, which uh, constitute society such as class, gender, race, and reason, reason. In order to protect different cultures, the Korean government will support arts that are based on the different cultural identities. We will also develop and provide diverse educations, educations. Furthermore, in order to uh, help colorful local cultures flourish, we will preserve, develop, and authenticity and the uniqueness of local cultures. The Korean government plans to set several social issues that are challenging Korean society by spreading uh, social creativity to final value. We will strengthen the capacity to concentrate cultural resources by merging culture with different fields. To this course end, we will be initiating various R&D projects so that we will may or merge arts and science, then we will be developing current that will bring together cultural industries. We will also pursue... Minister, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to conclude your remarks at that point. Okay, okay. Uh, through the, these three main values, autonomy, diversity, and creativity, as well as through programs of holding these values, career, yeah, issues, cultural workers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And apologies for interrupting anybody if they've got concluding remarks, but I really do make them concise. We'll get more in. I'm going to turn to the United Kingdom shortly, but first Gambia. And I'd like to call the Honourable Amat Enki Ba, the Minister of Tourism and Culture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speak uh, sorry, Mr. Presiding Officer, and of course, officials around you there. Let me take this opportunity to once again say I am happy to be in this city of amazing beauty, so much of architectural design that are beyond human imagination. I became very impressed and fallen in love with Edinburgh for the first time I visited the city. Mr. Uh, presiding Officer, I think 
it, will, it will not do justice to us as a delegation for three minutes on the issues that you want to discuss, knowing what has happened to others who have spoken for 20 minutes in the past and so forth. I just ask your indulgence to give me a little bit of extra time so that I can put my point across. <laughs> First of all, uh, uh, when I looked at culture in general and listened to the Scottish music and the instrument that you're playing is exactly what we have at home. And as a result, there is a, a Senegambian musician called Baba Mal. He has virtually settled in Scotland because the music of Scottish music and the Fulani music, the tribe I came from is almost identical, unique. It shows how complex this world is. And sometimes, when I was in China last year, when I heard them play the music at a gala dinner, it was like if I was in my village. So it shows how this world has come together, and yet still we try to divide it. Let me come on the issue of culture. I was invited by the German diplomat, Cultural Diplomatic Institute, myself and Gordon Brown and John Kofua, in March to give a speech on culture in general as a means of really resolving the current conflicts that we have in the world. Uh, Mr. Presiding Officer, looking at the issues, I think culture alone can resolve both our economic, social, and our problems in general. But unfortunately, policymakers are not taking culture seriously. And the implications and the ramifications of some of the decisions that we take, how much it can affect society. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Closer home, you can find in Nigeria today, they have the nomads. It's part of their culture and their way of life. If you go to parliament, make a law to ban it without telling them an alternative for them to be able to practice their culture, what you invite is violence. And we've seen the hundreds of people that have been killed in Nigeria today because there is a cultural practice that, has been, that they are trying to stop without giving an alternative. So as policymakers, we need to revisit, we need to examine what we do and how we do it. This is not unique to Nigeria. And I can tell you, in general, in most of our countries today, our minorities are at a disadvantage. They are at a disadvantage because those in power tend to use the media, the instrument of power, to deprive them of their cultural rights and their cultural practices and their way of life. As a result, what they do, they result to violence. And we've seen what happened in Palestine today. We've seen what happened with the ISIS. They've all been generated out of wrong policies that we as policymakers that we are doing and we are not taking into account. So if we want to keep peace today, cultural diplomacy must take center stage. And culture generally embodied all our way of life, the way we eat today. Thousand, today in my country, more people die of diabetes than any other disease. And yet still the West is saying diabetes is, is the disease of the rich man when we are coming from one of the poorest part of the world and people are dying of diabetes on daily basis in my country. Because the cultural, our way of eating, our food culture have been abandoned and we are adopting measures that are not part of our life. And we need to do how we, again, as policymakers, how we can really use culture to resolve our crisis as a judicial tool. How many times have we resolved at home using our cultural values and norms to resolve crisis? without going through the judicial process, the modern judicial process. I think there are a lot of other issues that we can take into account today. By using culture, we should be able to bring people closer together, not only about the economic gains. A country like United States of America get most of its revenue from the creative industry. We all know that as a fact of life. How many of us are now investing in culture to create the jobs, to support the system? Nigeria has succeeded in the film industry. India have succeeded, but how many other countries have succeeded in Africa or in the developing country to develop our music industry, our film industry, to make sure that the life of our people is changed in a positive manner? I, I want to hear you for 20 minutes, but we don't have it, so I'll give you another you. one minute yeah. absolute maximum. One more minute, okay. So, Mr. Presiding Officer, I want to believe that as we are gathered here today, we have learned so much, but I can tell you we could have given a lot more and I think in future, really, in organizing these conferences, people should be allowed, and every country at least to be given 10, 15 minutes to be able to come out with what is policy. Today in my country, culture has been considered as a priority sector of our government. 
And therefore, we are coming with a new cultural policy that takes all these things into account to address the differences and the issues that we have in order to bring people together and keep the country moving by virtue of the way if our people could have lived together 100 years ago using all the cultural values and practices, why can't we do it today? I think it's because we are wrong somewhere, our policies are wrong somewhere. It is not the power that, comp that can compel it. It is not the money that can buy it, it's the human spirit. And once that spirit is in us, we should be able to drive, use culture as a tool of peace, culture as an economic tool, culture as a, as a uniting force. And I think this is where we need to consider the future team of this conference. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. Thank you very much, Minister. And in a short second, we'll hear from Sierra Leone. But first, uh, from the United Kingdom, the Minister Michael Ellis, MP, Minister for Arts, Heritage and Tourism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the partners here today, the volunteers involved in organising such a wonderful uh, event, and especially uh, to you, Mr. Presiding Officer, for graciously hosting us uh, in this wonderful uh, and magnificent chamber. This summit, of course, provides a brilliant opportunity uh, for ministers, for artists, for practitioners, and, of course, for this year's uh, summit, notably uh, young practitioners, um, to come from across the globe uh, to discuss, to challenge, uh, and to formulate cultural strategies. And culture, as we know, has the power to bring people together, to bring places, to bring nations together, and enrich the lives of all of our citizens. And so I very much applaud everyone who has made the effort to come to Edinburgh uh, this year and engage in such lively discussions as we've been hearing. Everyone here today, presiding officer, knows that culture make our lives better. Uh, we also know that the opportunity to be an awed uh, audience member um, or a participant uh, of an arts event should be open, an opportunity open to everyone. Listening to the speeches this morning um, highlighted the positive role that culture can have on our lives, whether it's uh, the research that Dr. Habibi presented on the power of music on brain development, or the work that Professor uh, Bloom showed highlighting the impact of art on Parkinson's, whilst amazing us with evidence that uh, the choice to become uh, an artist reduces the likelihood to contract Parkinson's. Uh, amazing information there, and what a privilege, if I may say so, to see such a wonderful performance from Mr. Herman. I think we can all agree that we, as policy uh, makers in this room, we must continue to explore the potential use of our cultural assets in bettering the lives of people in our countries and across the globe. And I think we can all agree also that we have heard some powerful evidence that we can take back to our own countries and use as we develop future policy. It's an exciting time for those who um, advocate the role of arts in health. Uh, my former colleague uh, in his new role as Secretary of State for Health in the United Kingdom, Matt Hancock, recently announced four and a half million pounds for new uh, or existing uh, social prescribing projects in England. And there is a great opportunity here, I think, for cultural organizations and arts practitioners to further demonstrate how their work can ensure a healthy uh, society. Social and cultural relationships are key to good health, and I think anyone here today who has sung in a choir, volunteered at a museum, taken part in any other number of ways, um, can attest that the relationships forged uh, are, can be truly, truly meaningful and uh, life-changing. So, to conclude, uh, Mr. Presiding Officer, I hope everyone here has had the opportunity to engage uh, in positive and sometimes uh, challenging discussions, can take back thoughts, uh, ideas, and best practices to help formulate future cultural policies. If we can work together to demonstrate to others the true impact of arts and culture, society will become healthier and happier. Uh, we, the UK government, look forward to keeping these conversations going in the future with you all. I hope you've had the opportunity to enjoy the festivals uh, across Edinburgh during your time here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ellis. Shortly, we'll hear from South Africa, but first from Sierra Leone, Mrs. Meminatu B. Pratt, the Minister of Tourism and Cultural Affairs.
Ms. Pratt. Presiding officer, good afternoon to all the um, delegates, heads of delegations, distinguished um, guests, ladies and gentlemen. I stand here on behalf of the Republic of Sierra Leone as the Minister of Tourism and Culture. Now, um, the past two days have been very insightful. It has been highly informative. And all of the discussions have been really productive with many more ideas around the issue of culture. Today, we are looking at culture from many different dimensions. We are looking at culture in terms of the state of mind. How do we prepare citizens as to how they can be able to relate to, relate to culture physically and psychologically? And in all of these discussions, what is emerging is that we are breaking the barriers that has to do with um, resentment for other people's culture and trying to cement the relationship in terms of respect for other people's values. And this is extremely important so that we can be able to have common shared values. We can have common visions. And what has been most important here is the stories that we've been listening to, the different stories in terms of experiences from various countries. And I think this is the most remarkable process through which we can be able to integrate culture across the world. Now, we've seen during this meeting the powerful nature of culture, especially when it comes to music. The message is that um, we are now thinking of how we can move traditional modes through which we are looking at music into more modern ways in which music now can become as part of our life. Now we see music therapy emerging. For me, this is really a very good concept that I think we need to roll that out to medical practitioners across the world. How can music therapy be part of the way of providing healing? Now for Sierra Leone, we have come a long way. And of course, um, quite recently we had elections, so it's a very good new government and that has been in office for just like three months. But I should say that this is the very first time that the political will is there to support the establishment of the infrastructure for tourism and culture. And by that I mean, we are moving very quickly to change and to, to ensure that we transform our laws in order that we can create the enabling environment. And then we create the National Heritage Bill, which can give us the opportunity of establishing a National Heritage Commission why are we doing this? We are doing this because we have, we have huge value. We have, we have intrinsic um, cultural um, heritage sites, huge touristic values that are still untapped. So we are trying to put the mechanisms in place. The second reason is that we are tying the cultural transformation into creating jobs. We have a country where we have over 60% are youth, untrained and unemployed. So we are trying to link those concepts. How do we develop the creative industries and try to provide training and job markets for these young people? So, it's, so it carries a different meaning to us in terms of um, economic development, and which brings me to the very important concept of investment in, in, in culture. Now, in terms of looking at um, how do we see all of these pieces playing together in the network world, I believe this is the best way in which we can do it, because all of us have been able to pattern our lives around the digital technology. But I think commuting together as global citizens is extremely important so that we can be able to see ourselves face to face and be able to interact more. I will finally say that um, for us, this summit is coming at, 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 in a very timely manner because we are in the process of reviewing our laws. So it means most of what we are taking out of this meeting today or for the past two days are going to form the basis for the review of the new cultural, cultural policy. And secondly, we're going to use this in terms of how do we try to develop a more informed cultural education curriculum. Cultural education curriculum has its own deficits. I believe it's not only for Sierra Leone, because we are looking at catching them young. How do we start to develop and ensure that we provide the right type of education? This is extremely important because we are living in a world we are in, globalization, um, the internet, digital technology knows no boundaries. So that I think again is a, huge, it's a huge challenge in terms of what we are talking about. Because those who are exposed to technology are the youths, the young people. We are not there when they interact with technology and then trying to see how they can be able to, to deal with some of these issues. So as, as I conclude my statement, 
We are going to take a lot more in terms of this conference back to our policy making, back to how we are going to reform our, our infrastructure for tourism and culture. But my final question remains that um, we need to see how we can improve education at all levels so that digital technology does not destroy the efforts we are making in terms of promoting culture, well-being and investment. Let me thank you all. Thank you. Shortly we'll hear from Jamaica, but first from South Africa, the Deputy Minister of Arts and Culture, the Honourable Makotso Magdalene Sotio. Uh, Presiding Officer, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here to speak on behalf of our Deputy Minister of Arts and Culture in South Africa. She's not feeling well this afternoon. It was an eye-opener to hear colleagues from other countries reflecting on the importance of culture as the tie that binds us binds humanity together. The acceptance that humanity has experienced human conflict at a scale unimaginable since humanity itself is a result of lack of recognition and appreciation that as a people, we are different, but that differences should not be at the expense of one another. However, there is a wide recognition that it's only through culture that bridges can connect nations, that culture can facilitate dialogue whilst instilling pride amongst nations. As a colleague from Zambia said, telling a story is a key to preservation and promotion of culture and heritage. It was also heartwarming to hear about the Kanara initiatives towards reconciliation with indigenous people and the promotion of indigenous languages and culture. You are not alone in this regard. South Africa had had to deal with the recognition of indigenous people or what we refer as the first people. The promotion and protection of culture and heritage is paramount to us in South Africa. This is evident in many policies and legislation we have passed as a country for this very same purpose. As a, as a signatory of the UNESCO 2005 Convention on Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expression, we remain committed to this aspect of binding humanity together through culture. The debate in the Scottish Parliament took us on a journey of culture that knows no boundaries, or in the words of one of the speakers, an anonymous citizen. Speaker after speaker spoke of the role of culture in enhancing international dialogue and understanding that which is anchored on shared conversations and not sterile confrontation. I cannot agree more with the words of your poet, Edwin Morgan, that culture is the ability to open doors and let the let the light of the day shine in whilst that of the night shines out. Culture indeed has an ability to show the best of human, humanity with an enduring power to strengthen bowels between nations where we instantly become less foreign to one another. The story of Prince Doro we just heard this morning reminds us of how important cultural tolerance is and what happens when that tie which binds us loses its grip. We in South Africa also share the same sentiments, that culture reflects the past, challenges the present, and has the ability to change the future. We in South Africa are truly blessed that we have become known as the Rainbow Nation, that exposes the values of the great struggle icon, former and first democratic elected president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. This summit also coincides with our centenary celebration of this icon, who will have been 10, 100 years this year, a man who lived and strived for human understanding, appreciation, and acceptance of our diversity as a people. Since 1994, we as a nation we have been working tirelessly to build a country that recognizes that there is unity in diversity. This unity is anchored in our most progressive and critical acclaim constitution and the Bill of Rights. It is no sheer coincidence that a country we have managed to build a harmonious society of diverse people that comprises of 11 official languages and even more dialects. This difference is our biggest currency because there is strength in this collective. South Africa, through the Department of Arts and Culture, have long realized that cultural industries is our golden economy. As a department, we use this golden economy to reach out to the length and breadth of this country to find activities that talk to and contribute to the country's cultural sector. Annually, the department distributes up to 22 million US dollars initiatives that promote our culture and diversity. 
We also support 22 national flagship projects to the tune of 2.8 million a year. We have established funding agencies and cultural research institutions that are closer to communities that we serve, that we serve through these agencies and research institutions are in constant research for cultural solution aimed at bringing communities together while growing the cultural industries. Our invitation to this historical summit has also rekindled all relationship with our friends of liberation struggle who assisted us in training some of our leaders. We are reminded of the kind work of the British Council that provided education and learning opportunities through scholarships that saw some of our leaders receiving education in your country. Could I ask you to conclude your remarks, please? In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> allow me to express our gratitude on behalf of my government to the Edinburgh International Film Festival, the Scottish Parliament, who ensured the hosting of this successful uh, summit, and also next week, Tuesday, we'll be hosting the Prime Minister, Theresa May, in South Africa to visit Rowan Island, where Nelson Mandela spent many years uh, in prison there. Let us take the leave from Professor Richard Sinnott's assertion that, I quote, we need to build communities if we are to grow creative industries. This is a profound statement which I agree with. I thank you. Before I call Jamaica, just my, my apologies possibly to Romania and Canada. I'm not sure we've got time to call either. Maybe we'll get a, a few words if you wish to, but in the meantime, can I call from Jamaica uh, the Honourable Olivia Grange, CDMP, Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm speaking from the land of the fastest man on planet Earth, Usain Bolt. We thank the Scottish Parliament and the organisers of the summit for the invitation. We applaud the emphasis on youth, as without youth, involvement in shaping our programs and policies, we run the risk of, all, of alienating more than half of the world's population. So I really applaud you on this. Culture is an integral contributor to social and economic development and well-being. It is the lens through which we see the world and how we innovate and influence others. An example coming from Jamaica is the Blue and John Crow Mountains, which was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Mix Site in June 2015. And this provided us with an opportunity to develop economic initiatives around the designation. And I should highlight that this is one of the few mixed heritage sites in Latin America and the Caribbean and therefore significant for all peoples across the world. Jamaica, as, a, as are other countries present here, signatory to the 2003 UNESCO Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage. And this has been the driver for Jamaica's bid to have the reggae music of Jamaica, and I'm sure all of you know of our reggae music, inscribed on the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage of the world. We recognize that our music, the reggae music, has been an anthem for resistance and rebellion across the world, and also the impetus for change and the promotion of peace and love through our musical icon, Bob Marley. We want to, at this point, refer to some of our best practices in Jamaica. The Jamaica Cultural Development Commission Festival of the Arts has been a driver for us for heritage preservation through the annual festival program that spans inclusion and access through primary, high school age children, as well as children with disabilities. The festival is accessible and engenders widespread participation among young and old and persons with disabilities in our country. And this has helped to shape the identity of the nation through knowledge sharing of traditional folk forms and dissemination of intangible cultural heritage, especially our traditional dance forms. 
And I would like to use the opportunity now to highlight the excellent performance yesterday by Ong Keng Son, which shows the importance of fostering diversity in cultural life. Jamaica's recent election to the position on the UNESCO Executive Board will see me as minister advocating for small island developing states and is also my commitment to the global cause of cultural preservation and protection. Cultural relations such as this summit creates opportunities for mutual knowledge sharing, development of the enabling environments and infrastructures that underpin cultural investment and strengthen our cultural and creative enterprise. We further understand that our diversity is also underpinned with a shared history with countries like Scotland and anticipate continued bilateral dialogue, but also contributions from our colleagues all across the Commonwealth that are present at this forum. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, to highlight a concern that I have. It's the fact that here, although I'm happy to be here, I'm looking forward to more participation from the Caribbean and Latin America at this summit, in, at future summits, particularly due to our shared history. I end by saying and repeating the words of the Song of the Century. One, I'm sorry you all can't sing it. One love, one heart, let's get together. And let's sing it. One love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you very much, Minister, and what a lovely note, well, notes, to, uh, to finish on. Uh, thank you very much, delegates. Um, uh, apologies, thanks to those who kept the remarks brief. Apologies to those who I had to curtail. Uh, we're now going to move into our closing, or uh, formal proceedings for closing. I'm going to ask Jackie Killeen, if I can, uh, on behalf of the, uh, Christopher Rodriguez, the Chair of the British Council, and our Director here in Scotland, to say a vote of thanks. Jackie. Thank you, presiding officer, excellencies, honoured uh, honored guests and friends. My primary and most important task is to acknowledge and thank the people who have contributed to this year's summit and brought it so vividly to life. Before I turn to that, I will take just a few moments to reflect on some of the deep themes and sentiments that have come to the surface over the past few days across the structure and the scaffolding of the formal programme. I seem to have taken 26 pages of notes, but please don't worry, I won't inflict those on you. We have been really privileged to experience the summit in this chamber, which was intentionally designed to encourage dialogue and discourse among different perspectives, and in the rooms of the Parliament, which have given space for closer and more intimate exploration and exchange. We've experienced poetry and song, movement and musicianship, our presenters here in the plenaries and in the roundtable sessions have bravely and generously anchored their contributions in often deeply personal stories from their own lives. So that even when we have been looking at complex and challenging issues, all of which come with their own attendant theoretical frameworks, we have in fact had very little abstraction and instead we have had authentic and compelling evidence-based insight. Perhaps every generation feels this, but the sense of our species, the human race, being either at a crossroads, on the cusp, or in the very early stages of profound change, came strongly through many of our sessions. We heard that the world and our lives are confusing, confused, uncertain. We are permanently connected through electronic devices, but can feel perpetually alone. We see so much, we receive so much information, but we don't know if we can believe what we see or trust what we read. Trends such as urbanization, aging populations, growing inequality, technological advance, can often feel like they're putting a huge and unbearable pressure on our individual agency, on community, on landscape, on our physical infrastructure, and on our traditional culture. 
Happily and hopefully, we heard how we still have voice and choice, and that the choices we make are really important. There were eloquent examples of the resilience of culture over generations, and how culture can and does and will connect us to our own ancestral networks. Ong Keng Sen's talking about his connection to his mother's culture and traditions through film and theatre, saying that his mother, though passed away, uh, is, like, is present in him like a tailbone, um, vestigial but always present, will, will stay with me. In our session on culture and investment, we heard passionate advocacy for the role, power and further potential of culture in both tackling our biggest challenges and also making life worth living and fighting for. It was heartening to hear all our speakers, whether artists or ministers or other representatives from delegations, unquestioningly accept the case for culture. But as some of the roundtable discussions and online discussion shows, there is still a call for that to be action, not lip service, as well as a debate to be had about what investing in culture really looks like. We had some very hopeful examples from the High Line in New York to the approaches being adapted in various countries that ministers have talked about in their responses today, Brazil, Lithuania, Sierra Leone and Gambia being uh, cases in point. Today, for those of us who were here in 2016, it was a joy to return to the intersection of art and science and to extend the exploration that was begun two years ago and also to rejoice in the further advances in knowledge and practice that have taken place in the intervening period. I think we will all remember David and Toto's um, orchestration and choreography, Faisal's gift of laughter and a red nose, and Julian's beautiful and heart-lifting uh, musical performance. I take away from all of those that this cross-disciplinary, intergenerational, intersectional collaboration needs to become the, the norm and the mainstream, not just exciting ex exceptions that we that we become inspired by. We can be so much more if we work in this way constantly. We can choose to act on Dr. Habibi's evidence-based request that we invest in creative education because the greatest resource that we have for our future is the creative and intellectual capacity of our children. We can choose to hear and accept Sanjoy Roy's offer that artists are here to help. They will put their shoulders to the wheel against the hardest challenges and work with wider society. We can embrace the prescription of Professor Blum and Dr. Calderwood, who we heard from earlier, and build a future of care comprised of artists and medics working together. But we must also care for our artists too. This was beautifully encapsulated by our youth delegates from Kenya and Singapore in their earlier responses. And one of the particular highlights of the summit for me this year has been the increase in intergenerational and shared ownership of this huge, important agenda. I, had, I loved to see yesterday um, the exchange and learning both between the young delegates and also from the young delegates in our afternoon session. Now to the thanks. A summit like this is a co-production, a huge amount of art, engineering, energy, effort and cooperation has been invested in bringing this summit to life and nearly to conclusion. So please allow me and join me in giving some thanks. First, I would like to thank all ministers, all delegates and representatives who have chosen to prioritise culture just by coming here. In particular, I'd like to thank our young delegates and those who have joined us for the first time. I'd like to very sincerely thank each and every one of our speakers, performers, chairs, facilitators and rapporteurs. You've made a huge contribution to the last few days. Our indefatigable team of volunteers and aides, our generous funders, sponsors and supporters, whether they be public or private. The venues and institutions hosting visits here in Edinburgh and in Dundee. Her Majesty the Queen, and the Palace of Holyrood House for their hospitality. From me personally, all my colleagues in the British Council, across the world and across the organisation, and a note that some of us still have work to do as colleagues sitting at the back will be producing a summit report for you to read in due course. And now especially thanks to our partners. 
I would like to thank the Edinburgh International Culture Summit Foundation, most especially Sir Angus Grossart and Sir Jonathan Mills, and the summit team. I would like to thank the First Minister who joined us yesterday, our Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop, who has been here throughout, and the whole team at the Scottish Government. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Jeremy Wright, QC MP, Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and Mr Michael Ellis, MP, who are, is our Minister for Culture, who has been here today as well as well as the whole DCMS team and wider UK departments, including UK government departments, including the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and their embassies and consulates who have all played their part. I'd like to thank Fergus Linehan and the team at the Edinburgh International Festival. They're actually quite busy this time of year. They have other things going on, but they have nevertheless managed to contribute uh, enormously to this. I'd like to thank our knowledge partners, and I would like to thank the presiding officer, the Right Honourable Ken McIntosh, MSP. <laughs> and in fact, the whole team at the Scottish Parliament who have worked, I would say, ferociously behind the scenes uh, to give us this experience. I'd like to thank them for welcoming this summit and for hosting us so graciously. My final thought is that I hope you will all leave here with a sense of shared purpose, with renewed resolve and belief in the power of what you're doing and the importance of culture, with new ideas and with deepened and expanded networks. Our honourable friend from Ghana in his uh, ministerial response yesterday said, and I hope I am not misquoting him too badly, he said, we are all wearing the same garment and together we sink or float. And in that spirit, I would like to thank you all for your participation and wish you well. Thank you very much, Jackie. And now could we call the only partner from whom we have not heard, Fergus Linehan, Director of the Edinburgh International Festival. Um, presiding Officer, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of all of the Edinburgh festivals and the many thousands of artists, producers, technicians and administrative staff who've delivered this year's festivals, I'd like to thank you for your attendance in our city over the past few days. I'd also, of course, like to echo Jackie's thanks to all of the partners and the summit staff. Um, it feels fitting that much of the conversation over the past few days has centred around ideas of connectedness as this city in August is both a celebration of our interconnectedness, but also an investigation of our individual cultural um, values. It, it occurs to me that there are moments in time when it feels like there is an urgency around connectedness and interconnectedness. Such a moment was 1947, the year our festival was founded, a time when the hostilities of the Second World War had just come to a close. And the decade that had preceded it was defined by ideologies that sought to emphasize differences. And in the founding principles of the festival, we can sense an almost primal need to reconnect and reunite and reconcile. That spirit continued <clears throat> in the decades that followed and found a powerful voice in Paris in the 1970s when a British director, Peter Brook, with a group of artists and thinkers from all over the world, came together to form the International Centre of Theatre Research, a loose organisation which sought out shared narratives across our cultures so that we could celebrate a sense of shared humanity. <clears throat> that work culminated a decade later in Brooks' masterwork, the Mahabharata, um, which played in the Tramway Theatre in Glasgow in 1988 with a young boy called Akram Khan. Um, Peter is now 92, and is working up the road in the Lyceum Theatre. We we're about, about to go up and do a public interview with him. Um, and Akram, of course, has just uh, contributed to the summit, given us his work, Zenos, and of course, uh, choreographed Kadamati, which many of us saw on Wednesday outside the Palace of Holyrood. Um, Kadamati and Zenos are both reflections on the end of conflict, and the prisoner um, considers questions of guilt and forgiveness. So interconnectedness, I think, is still key to reconciliation on both a personal and a societal level. Um, as the poet laureate Seamus Heaney, um, or the Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney wrote of the conflict in Northern Ireland, if we can find a language, perhaps we can find a solution. 
Um, one of the most urgent questions that I think has emerged from much of the work in Edinburgh in August and the discussion here is the question of who has access to this interconnected world. The anxiety that a globally connected world favours large urban centres and tech-savvy populations while excluding and alienating others. At the same time, I think there are further questions about authorship, about appropriation, about representation, and a note of caution, perhaps, that people's people's stories, music, paintings, and culture are very powerful and need to be approached with great respect and rigor. The question around cultural interconnectedness are being negotiated and debated in the stages and concert halls of the city and indeed in the parliament over the past few days. And there's no doubt that those debates are fluid and ongoing. Another key discussion point over the past few days has been around infrastructure. Um, before I took on this post and came to live in Edinburgh, I would always come here every year for almost two decades and, like everyone, ask the question, how can we replicate what happened in Edinburgh? What did happen in Edinburgh? Why is Edinburgh this festival city? And there's a number of reasons for that, not least the extraordinary people who founded it in 1947, but at the core of it, I believe, is a venue, the Usher Hall. In 1914, uh, when Edinburgh's population was half what it is now, a philanthropist called Andrew Usher bestowed upon the city a music venue, which was in reality far larger and of a high, far higher quality than was required at the time. Around the same time, the King's Theatre was being constructed and the Empire Theatre, now the Festival Theatre, was rebuilt. So this modest city was building a cultural infrastructure that went far beyond the requirements of the citizenry and unbeknownst to itself was building the foundation of the Edinburgh festivals. But I don't think that that was accidental. I think it reflected a view not of what the city was but what of the city might become. And as we approach major cultural projects, be they capital or otherwise, we of course write business plans and assess economic impact. But at the heart of any of those plans lies a fundamental philosophical position that the future of our city or of our country or of the world will be brighter, that future generations will have bigger and better dreams than us, and that our core job is to ensure that they'll have the tools to realize them, that our best years essentially have yet to come. So when people say to me, how could we replicate what happened here in Edinburgh, I would always give them three pieces of advice build optimistically, build implausibly, and build for generations yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fergus. And uh, I think it's only fitting that we uh, close our uh, cultural summit with an artistic performance. And to that end, I would like to invite Bea Webster, who is a Glasgow-based actress and theatre maker who graduated with a BA performance in British Sign Language and English at the Royal Conservatoire in Scotland to perform Long Lost Lover. Thank you. A narrow dawn breaks on the airport of my childhood. Thick air of spices warmed and tenderness enters my nose and breaks out a wave of no salsia and here I am, the home of my soul. Dom Rang embraces me like a long lost lover. Over the temple of the dawn, the sun rises, where a sea of saffron monks lines up to receive alms upon the old Venice of the East, as Asian wish takes me to my family. Bangkok embraces me like a long lost lover.
Oh, but the shower pream rapper, the sun shine on this mountain water, with this Buddha head buried in the tree from more in time long gone, when there's one showers in golden leaves, I tear embrace me like a long lost lover. Over the Gulf of Thailand, the sea clutters, hermit crabs make home in plastic, beasting on watermelons from beast cumas, littered with gay street, tolerated for no rights, pattern that embraces me like a long lost lover. Oh, but the hilly rice plains, the rice kept in life. My mechanical heels picks up, clattering, thumping, tapping, and shouts of 20 baht, sheep, sheep, sheep. Mercenaries wear of ancient times, shine my embrace to me like a long lost lover. From the atom and sea to the golden plains, the land of the smile always creeps me warmly. Even though it sees my broken ear, they say that I must have done wrong my past life. Thailand embraced me like a long lost lover. A microphone on for the rest of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pia. That was excellent. What a lovely way to conclude our uh, summit today. And uh, that is it. Uh, thank you for me. Before, when I close, as always, I'll hand over to Joanne Kendall, who will uh, escort you or tell you where to go to get, um, I think, buses to the v &A for those who, those who are going there. Um, but I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the last few days. I hope you found it stimulating. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed Edinburgh in particular. And to give you the a Scottish farewell, haste ye back. Thank you very much. I close this meeting of the 2018 Edinburgh Cultural Summit. Thank you.